Okay, so everyone's in. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to the second Sotnar. There is no such thing as perfect technique, an ecological approach to skill acquisition with our guest, Rob Gray. Uh, my name is Courtney Sot. Courtney is a current national team kayaker and also Ontario team apprentice coach. Uh, my name is Rob Stott. And Rob is my favorite uncle, former national <laughs> team coach and head coach at the Richmond Hill Canoe Club. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let everybody know that there will be a question period at the end. So please feel free to put questions in the chat, raise your hands or come off mute to ask questions. All right, let's get to it. Rob, hello. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Thank you for coming on today. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into perceptual motor control? Yeah, so I should start off. I'm originally from Canada. I'm, I'm from Toronto area. I grew up. I was just there a couple of days ago for the first time in a while. Um, yeah, so I kind of, uh, my background is psychology. Um, kind of, I uh, got interested in understanding performance and how to uh, both, uh, how to, I like to say how to pe make people get good, the skill acquisition and dealing with problems when people, when it goes bad like choking under pressure and return from injury and things like that. So, so I've been studying that and, and thinking about that for a long time in mostly in sports, but also in other domains like uh, driving safety. I've worked in the air force with, AV, with pilots and things like that. So, so it's been a, a really fun kind of a, uh, to work with a lot of really high level people that are better at things than I am. Okay, great. Yeah, and I mean, I, I've listened to your your podcast, uh, Perception and Action Podcast, which is which is excellent. It's really the the best thing in that space. Uh, I've listened to it maybe since 2017 or so, but it really was the last few months I realized, hey, this this guy's from Canada. Like, <laughs> you kept talking about being a hockey goalie, and then you said you're from Toronto area and uh, and went to York, et cetera. So that's even even more special that we have a Canadian on, and even though we're mm -hmm. Ontario focused here, it's we have we have coaches and athletes from across the country. So, uh, so thanks cool. again for coming on. So, uh, I mean, and, and there were a couple of colleagues, some coaches, and some sports science people that actually had heard of you, which was great. Uh, and probably the podcast helps that. So, uh, and, and your approach, I think, is is interesting. So, if you can just give us an overview of, of the ecological approach and, and how it differs from traditional coaching, let's say, um, instruction. Yeah, so so kind of um, you know, and I've been kind of studying this for a while, but in recent years, it, this kind of growing movement, I, in my book, I call it a revolution in the way we think about skill, moving away from the idea that the way that you get skillful is by being uh, taught the one correct technique that you practice over and over again through repetition until you got it down. You're automatic. You don't have to think about it. Um, to the idea that being skillful is actually being able to um, do multiple different ways of doing things, being adaptable and adjustable to your environment. And, and instead of trying to repeat the same thing over and over again, you need to be more variable in your movements, have more uh, you know, inconsistency, things we used to think were bad. And it's kind of a big change for, from a coach as the coach is the instructor here, here I'm coming to you. I have all the answers you do. I'm going to give it to you to the coach as more of a designer and a guide. I'm going to design a practice environment activity um, with way more variability and openness and let you kind of find the, what works for you. So part of it is also accepting that individuality is right. What's best right. technique for me might not be the best for you. Right. So I think, you know, a lot of the, paddlers athletes and, and coaches that are on the line like you know get it like you know the frustration of like okay you know straighten your arm straighten your arm straighten your arm and it's like days months years later straighten your arm they still don't straighten your arm right mm -hmm. so that you know like what can we do to to, to kind of get over that like our sport is very technical i know courtney sent you a video so it's very technical and yet you know paddlers get to the national team and they still quite can't do it and it's hard to intervene then because you gotta you gotta train right so mm -hmm. Um, so it, it, it could be hard to, it could be hard to, to change. And I guess for me, this, this seems to be two big pieces here. Like it's a skill acquisition, which we kind of titled this, this talk, but there's also, which you have, you know, learning something and you have that developmental end. And then 
you have that continuum to, to performance and we have several high performance athletes on the call. So you have the skill act and you have the performance piece, right? Where, you know, thinking too much can kind of get in the way and it leads into sub performances or choking, which I'd like to talk about later. But I know Courtney has, wants to talk about her uh, recent experiences with this as a lead into the next questions. Yeah, this was introduced to me, uh, I think in March. So only like three, three months ago. And uh, I had that view of, you know, where I, my goal when I go on the water is to take the exact same stroke after the next, after the next. And I can understand how there may not be no one correct technique when I look at one person versus another. But when it comes to that individual level, I kind of struggled to understand that and see that variability within my stroke from st stroke to stroke is actually a good thing and actually leads to more success. Um, and that it's more of, um, and I think, I think just like my main question is, cause I'm still like struggling a little bit with it and it is still like very new to me mm -hmm. of understanding this concept is just like be being in a cyclical sport of like paddling or running. It's like very different than baseball or any other game mm -hmm. is that, um, when an athlete is like repeating the same movement over and over again, is there still like repetition without repetition? And like the, just the importance of variability within a cyclical sport, like how is that different or is it not different? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's a very fair question, Courtney, and really, really good one. Yeah. So the idea is, you know, first of all, it's to say it, this, I, this kind of ecological approach is not to say that there are some features that need to be there, right? Some key features of the movement. You can't just paddle any old way and be be successful, right? There's some, mm -hmm. um, I, I call them invariants. There's things that need, need to be there. Um, but around that, the, the idea, the fundamental idea is I, I can't, if I want the same outcome going fast and straight or whatever and continuing, mm -hmm. I can't achieve it by doing the exact same thing because everything around me and inside of me is changing, right? The, the water's changing, the wind's changing. I'm getting fatigued. Um, I'm, maybe I'm sore from a workout. So I, the same kind of exact movement is not gonna produce the same outcome. But you know, for certain sports like reactive sports like baseball and soccer, there's gonna be much more variety changes in the condition than in, in paddling, which is kind of a self, we call a self-paced, right? You're, you're driving it yeah. yourself. Um, so the idea, you're probably going to need less variability, but you, you're still going to need some to, right, to be able to adjust to the different uh, conditions and, and external and internal conditions. And the idea is, you know, we want to give the athlete the ability to develop that, the, the, the adaptability. And the, the, the phrase you use, repetition without repetition. So I want to repeat my outcome, but I can't do it by exactly repeating the movement. So sometimes these variations we're talking about are quite small, like you need kind of need to be able to measure the movement to actually see them. Um, but the idea is that they're always going to be there, right? And, and if we're using a really simplified, repetitive drill in practice, we're not giving the athlete the chance to develop this kind of adaptability. Right. So it's not repeating the movement per se. It's repeating like the problem solving process. Yeah, exactly. So you think of okay. like in, you know, in like in, in basketball, like you have to release the ball a certain with your hand at a certain angle. That's that needs to be repeated. But how you do that changes with whether there's someone in your face defending you, where you are on the floor, whether you're tired, you know. So to get that this outcome to repeat, you need to do a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. so that's kind of the, the general idea. Okay. Okay. So when, when we're, here's an easy one for you, um, whether we're learning a new skill or, or we're relatively new or we're performing at the highest level, what, what the heck should we be paying attention to? Uh, so yeah, a, sim a simple answer that kind of the motor learning research has shown for a long time is not what your body's doing, right? That's a, the simple answer. Paying attention to what your hands are, whether your arms straight, is what we call and we call it an internal focus of attention, focusing on the actual movement execution. From um, there's a large body of research over tw 25 years now um, by a person led by a person named Gabby Wolf at the UNLV, UNLV shown 
that's far inferior way to to control a movement and learn as opposed to focusing externally something on the outside of the environment uh the the water ahead of you the sound your paddle is making in the water uh any the feel of the water so anything but your what your arm your body position is doing and um that's kind of part of this approach too we want the, the big I, one of the fundamental ideas in, in ecological approach is that skill occurs through self-organization. Your body kind of organizes itself <laughs> of the where your arm, how much your elbow bends, your how straight your arm is. It, you have to just let it, right? If you think about too much about what your body's doing by focusing your attention on it, um, and, and kind of foreshadowing, you know, the point we you said earlier, that's what we think happens in choking. Choking, you get the stakes are so high, you're so important, this next pot on the golf green, okay, I better make sure my, my head's down. I better make sure my grip's right. And you start focusing internally and you disrupt kind of the, the, the skill you developed. So that's one of, one of the big things for sure we found. And as a coach, what you kind of can do is you kind of, you need to kind of change the language that you use with your athletes, right? Um, you know, in, in, instead of saying push your push off from your back foot, say push the ground away, right? The first one I'm talking about your foot. The second one I'm talking about the ground the thing in the environment. It sounds trivial, but it does make it, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah that uh, your podcast with Gabby Wolf and, and her colleague, I forget her name, like it's 25 minutes long and I've sent that to my coaches. It's a nice little uh, it's a great little interview. Um, it just covers kind of like, you know, autonomous learning and, and the internal versus external stuff really, really well. So, uh, okay, Courtney. Um, yeah, you mentioned self-organization and um, that's just basically like letting the athletes figure it out themselves. But like at what point would a coach step in for correction or at what point do you bring it from external back into internal? Like, is there a, I feel like, does the ecological approach like allow that? Um, yeah, so definitely. So um, the, the idea is, yeah, we want the athletes to kind of figure out things on their own, your body to figure out things on your own. But that doesn't mean, you know, as a coach, if you see them doing a technique that you know is not going to work um, and or cause injury that you shouldn't mm -hmm. step in. The way that we want to change it, and, and the, the, um, this, this is, I do a lot of baseball research, and one of the problems I deal with a lot is pitchers, young pitchers coming out from high school, college, they have this thing where they, when they throw, they separate their arm from the body really early, kind of to generate a whip, and we know that's just going to blow out your elbow <laughs> eventually. It's working now. Um, what we don't want to do in general, when we, we have a problem like that is get really internal and try to give them a solution. We don't want to say, okay, you need to focus on keeping your arm too close to your body longer or this. You need to bend your elbow 20 degrees instead of 40 degrees. That gets them all internally focused. The preferred approach that a lot of people are moving to is what's called a constraints-led approach. So what we want to do is somehow change the practice conditions such that what they're doing won't work anymore, right? So it won't allow them. So what I do in the example I gave is I, I, I put a big kid's rubber ball, ball under their arm and I say, I want you to pitch. And when you let go of the baseball, this kid's ball needs to go forward, right? And if they move their arm too early, it just falls out, right? It'll never work. So I'm giving them something to encourage them to stop doing what they're doing. Um, you, you could do this by using, you know, a different length of paddle, a different material of paddle. <laughs> like, so you, mm -hmm. you're trying to, you're not telling them specifically what they need to correct on their body. You're trying to add a constraint that kind of gets them to try something else. That's kind of the, the preferred approach. So, but it, yeah, it, there's kind of a misconception in this, that it's purely hands-off coaching that you just stand back and let them do whatever you want. Right. Um, it's definitely not that you still want to step in when you see something that you don't like or you want to change. Okay. Yeah. I mean, th th there's so many different kind of sub areas in this, in this approach, but just staying with the internal versus external and your, uh, I, your, I think it was one of your studies, 2004 with the, with the batters and it was really highlighted in, in the, 
Winkleman's book around like, mm-hmm. the slump and what they focused on like that that kind of blew me away when I saw what they were would you mind just kind of giving a little summary of that and um on what they went through and, and what like the slumpers versus the, the ones that were on yeah street? so we've done a bunch of studies I you know with golf and baseball and some other sports where we get to we measure what people are focusing on and in general, we find when people are in a big slump, they're more internally focused. Like if you ask them, how much was your knee bent on that swing? They're really good at judging that <laughs> way better than normal. They're also really good at that when they're recovering from an injury, right? People get really internally focused on their body. If I, if I come back from ACL knee surgery, I'm really focused on my knee at first because I'm worried about hurting it again. And having that focus kind of hurts performance. One of the things that makes it hard to get back to your normal level of performance. So yeah, in a bunch of series of studies, we found kind of paradoxically people are good, uh, uh, but at the wrong thing. Uh, They're really good at making judgments about their body, which we don't really want per se. We want you focusing more externally. I guess that would be a bit of a signal if they they were really good at describing Mm -hmm. like movements like that, like to a T, then and they're just a little bit too much in there. Yeah, I found a lot of the, like some of the hitters I work with, they'll talk about like swinging down at the ball and you look at the movement, it, it's up. <laughs> like right. they're not good at describing it at all. They, they, they have some idea the cues they use, but they're actually not really aware of what's going on at that kind of level uh, for sure. When they're right. performing well, yeah. Yeah. And then the, so the, the, the baseball guys that were, that were like in a groove and, and, and on a streak, what, what was their, what was their, like, what were they mainly focused on? So they were really good at telling you things like uh, what the position of the field fielders were, was the second baseman closer to the second base bag or the third, this, oh, yeah. you know, where they were good at, where was the pitcher, where the ball went when it left my bat exactly, what direction. Right. Uh, so out, things in the outside world. They were yeah. really good at, yeah. Um, then, when they were at the play, actually just, you know, batting, what, what was their main focus of attention? Yeah, that, so they, yeah, it was, yeah. so the people were performing well. And you just find this kind of generally, like when people are really hot and have a good round of golf, they'll tell you all about, yeah, this green was cut this way and this, you know, the, they won't tell you about all oh, my body, my knees were, feet were two feet apart. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're, they're describing, yeah. they have really good awareness of the outside. And all that information is useful, like um, like I'm like in paddling for like picking up information from the water and the course and the thing. That's all external to your body. That's what you want to be focusing on, right? Rather than what your body let your body do it itself. It, 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 uh, f- trying to control your body, kind of sending commands like bend your elbow now, straighten your arm now, is way too slow, right? For to be effective in almost every sport, yeah. Right, right, right. Courtney? Yeah, I think I have a question just about um, external cueing and if there's any differences um, on skill level that you see or age level or male versus female when it comes to these types of cues. Like, is there one group that um, really excels with external cueing or is it kind of all the same across the board? Um, that, that's a good question. There's a little bit of controversy in the research of, about this issue, but um, for a while, a lot of people be, believe that you wanted to start internal. People were first learning export and go external. Um, I think we've kind of moved away from that and, and think that external, it doesn't mean like internal, internal is good for uh, some things like uh, when you're um, getting them to feel things. And, and, and But I think in general, external uh, is beneficial for all all athletes we see. Um, the other kind of variant of using external cues is something we call learning by analogy. Mm-hmm. So if you want an athlete, so I work in tennis as well. So one of the things I see, I often get young players will come on the court and they'll hit the ball way behind them, their feet, and they'll have a really flat stroke, which is not what you want. So instead of describing what you should be doing with your body, I say swing like a rainbow. Uh, okay. So they it, it, they immediately think arc in their thing, but I'm not describing them the movement. Or imagine you're like playing a, um, a little shot in, in tennis, like a drop shot. Imagine you're 
you're an elephant, <laughs> right? This, these, these kind of things with kids. So I think those kind of things, especially with kids are, are really effective. Um, but yeah, it's, but you're, you're right. It does, you do need to do a bit different. And also some of the things we were talking about, like adding variability to practice, you don't want to overwhelm new, new learners, right? You need to kind of to not give you too less, less variability for, for, for novice yeah. kids. And, and yeah. Yeah. I get them started. You don't, you don't want to take a, like a person who never played tennis and have a tons of different angles of shots yeah. and speeds and court surfaces and things like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Save, save that. Mm. Yeah. So what, what do you, uh, if you could explain, I know you sign off with this all the time uh, on your podcast, keep them coupled. If you could explain what, what, what that means, uh, Exactly. Um, that, that the idea there is that you know our our movements and our actions are driven our, our action is driven by information from the environment. So our action our our actions are coupled to our perception, right? And the the so all, all what I want to do in practice as much as I can is keep that together, right? And there's some a lot of examples in sports where we break that apart like hitting a baseball off a tee, right? There's all the action there. You don't have to perceive anything. Right, okay, that's a good example, yeah, 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 yeah. The other one I always pick on is dribbling around cones in soccer, right? When I go left or right for, with the soccer ball, it's for a reason, right? I detect that you're coming at me. <laughs> I pick up information from your body. There's no information from a cone, right? There's right. no, um, so the idea is you wanna keep the information that drives the actions there as much as possible rather than decomposing the skill and breaking it apart into pieces um, to make it easier for the athlete. We want to want to keep things there. That's kind of the idea. Well, I like the way you said there's no information from a cone. That kind yes. Of, that yeah. kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no reason why there's no inherent reason to go left or right around yeah. the cone, right? Yeah. It's the same, right? Yeah. Versus if you're coming to take the ball in with me or I want to get around you to score, there's going to be a reason to go left or right and, and at a certain time. And yeah. 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 Yep. Well, that's good. That's good. Uh, Courtney, do you have anything? Yeah. I think just like bringing up the cones and how, you know, they're just there. They don't actually do anything. What about, um, it just made me think of like the amplification of errors. So I feel mm -hmm. like that whole cone thing doesn't really help you uh, like search for a new strategy or anything like that. But can you talk a little bit about that um, idea of amplifying errors and how that actually helps with performance? Yeah, that's that's a, a really interesting one. Yeah, the, the idea is that sometimes when you have a small an aspect of a movement pattern that you don't like, um, for example, though, I think the one I talk about in my book a lot is a study of golfers where novice golfers aren't shifting their weight to their back foot as much uh, to generate the force. Um, sometimes when you get them to exaggerate that, you say, I want you to shift your weight to the back foot even less, or I want to shift that you give them the wrong thing instruction. It actually paradoxically kind of helps them because they perceive, they get more per perception of what's, what's wrong with it. Right. Um, the other thing I like to do in like in golf and baseball is I give uh, athletes, I don't know if anyone does this in rowing, it'd be interesting. <laughs> you give them a flexible shaft putter or bat and right. any kind of like hitch you have where you, in your swing, where you're, you're, you're disrupting the kind of flow. Um, it will now it will go really crazy, <laughs> right? <It'll laughs> exaggerate it and you'll really notice it. Um, and, um, so that's the, that's the kind of idea. Sometimes, um, other things I've done, like um, you know, we, we do with, um, sometimes we have athletes that when they land, they're a little crooked, their ankles rolled a little bit, which, uh, over the long term can like, lead to a knee injury. What I like to do is actually then is like take them in a sandbox. So now when they roll, they almost fall over because <laughs> right. it really exaggerates it. And then, so they, they get more information about this kind of technical issue. So Rob, but you want to oh, finish, finish No, up. go ahead, Rob. No, so we, we want to we keep you popular with our group. So you, you made you misspoke when you called us rowing. So just to be okay. clear. <laughs> paddling. Oh, sorry. Paddling. Yeah. I Same know guys, rowing is. Yeah, Same guys, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, just, you know, we're, we're all we're sensitive. To our, as, as Very as different. So. Um, I don't so, know if there's any, I've read any. There's, there's some studies on rowing, the 
you know, yeah, yeah, versus yeah. I know I, I'm actually so my I, I used to go canoe trips uh, in uh, uh, Algonquin Park. So uh, I used to sit in the front very scared when I had a very skilled paddler in the back when we <laughs> yeah. do rapids and things. So I appreciate the, the skill involved for sure. For sure. But I'll be careful. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> no problem. It's just something funny. Um, okay. The now, um, uh, uh, what about uh, autonomy? What's the what's the importance of, of autonomy or autonomous learning? Yeah. So that that goes that that episode you mentioned in the interview with Gabby Wolf and I think it's Rebecca. Right. Um, they have this model called optimal theory of learning. This idea that there's some key features that help people learn. Um, one of them is a the focus of attention. You want to try to make people internal. The other one is, is to give people uh, at, autonomy over the learning process. And and the, 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 and the, there's a couple different ways. One, the one that they promote a lot is giving athletes choice over the design and practice. Um, I, I like this a, a lot, um, and, I, and I'd use this in things like soccer. Um, so in soccer, we do a lot of what we call small-sided games. So we play games, and we add a rule, like you have to pass twice before you can shoot, or you have to keep the ball on this side of the field. And uh, one of the things I like to do is that every once in a while, you get the kids to come up with a rule, make a rule that you have to follow for this practice activity. And a lot of times it's a crazy one and it's not really, but giving them kind of uh, a stake in it. Um, and I think this really works at the highest levels to a lot kind of co-adaptive practice. So you have the athlete reflect on what they thought worked and didn't, and then help kind of design uh, the, the next practice session. I, I think it's really, uh, there's both kind of basic psychological effects like autonomy feeling you know that your autonomy the idea that you're you're in charge of your your skill acquisition your own um but i think in motivation and i think there's a lot of effects like that as well so they had three things that they talked about right and they were kind of additive there was the external mm -hmm. versus internal there was the the uh, what we just spoke about the autonomy mm -hmm. and then they talked about you know doing one was good doing two was better and doing the third one was even do you, do you know what the third one was in that? Uh... I think they believe they had uh, expectations, like how, yeah, whether yeah, you exceed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. they, did, they did these series of interesting studies. I don't know how it applies. They were, they actually use these visual illusions to make a golf hole look bigger than it really was. Uh, and they showed that people learn better under that, even though it's a, physically the same size as the other hole. Um, okay. Cause they expected that they were going to make it. Um, so I think, I think that's um, I, the other I kind of funny thing is I one of the biggest things I, I think is important for coaches now, especially if you're going to follow this method is almost a, the opposite, right? Um, the one of the things, a lot of things that when I, I do a lot of consulting and stuff, I look at people's practices. Um, they're two, they're more like performances, like uh, everyone's doing everything perfectly. And we know that's not when you learn, right? You learn by when you're challenged, you're going to make mistakes. So one of the things I think it's really important for the coach is if you're going to add all this variability and all the weird equipment and things I'm describing, you have to set the expectation. You're, this is going to be a tough day, right? I expect you to not be perfect every time because I think athletes get the idea that they have to be perfect in practice all the time. Right. But we know that's not, that's not when you grow and, and adapt and learn. Right. So it's, there's that element of it too, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Good. Courtney. Yeah. Just you mentioning that reminds me of the part in your book where I think it was something about like biking up a hill. And if you're tired, that hill is going to seem steeper than maybe on a day when you're not as tired. Yes. Yeah. Um, we kind of yeah. see the world by what our ability to act on it, which is kind yeah. of it really, there's a, a large body of kind of embodied perception, which is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that, you know, it's really, really important as a coach to kind of uh, guide that, use that and, and shape it. And, and um, the other, you know, the interesting thing I found is, is with parents, when I work a lot with kids, because they watch my, the way I coach sometimes and they, there's, the kids all aren't all in nice, nice lines. I'm kind of walking around, not saying much at all. <laughs> and they're like, 
what am I paying for here? Right. You don't look, yeah. you're not barking a whole bunch of instructions and drilling them and things like that. So you kind of have to change their expectations as well. Well, I think that's a really good point because it could certainly give off the perception that you're, you're not coaching, right? You're not doing anything. Yes. Yeah. Like, like you know, that you're, yeah, you're not, you're the, that's the, the, the kind of instructor to, to designer kind of role, as yeah. I mentioned. Yeah. 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 That's good. That's yeah. good. Um, so, and what about the, um, like the, the general, like what, what's the best way to give, to give feedback? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there's kind of two, um, the, the one, there's some guidelines that kind of the research has shown. I think um, one of the things we found is there's a large body of research showing the athlete, the, what's called self-controlled feedback. So letting the athlete decide when they want detailed feedback from you. Like when they do really poorly, they know, and they really don't need you to tell them. <laughs> All right. Um, so there's there's a bunch of research showing that when you ask athletes choose which rep. Um, the other, the, the big one that kind of worries me, um, and then I try to get, get people to comment about it is with all the technology we have now, we have so many pieces of feedback we can give you about your movement that you can't perceive yourself. You know, you're, your pat, your stroke rate. Uh, yeah. we, we could give you all these kind of things. We have to be careful. There's a lot of research showing we don't want to do that too much. Um, what we call extrinsic feedback from the outside. We want the athlete to know how well they did based on their own senses, right? Was that, am I doing the right way? Being able to control, regulate that themselves without some technology telling them all the time. So when we give a kind of that kind of uh, extrinsic feedback, we want to kind of do it okay, not on every execution, kind of use it sparingly. Um, and cause the other thing that creates, if you, in some sports is people again, get very internal. Like if you, if you give them feedback about what their hands are doing, they start focusing on their hands, things, things like that. So, but in general, so yeah, I think, you know, feedback is very important. Um, you know, I think, um, as I said, there's some, those are some basic things about that the research shows is how we can use it. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you handle athletes that will like always come to you for feedback or like almost like rely on a coach too much for feedback? Yeah, there's, um, there's you know, the, the, one of the things I've encountered too with this is there's some people, athletes that just want you to tell them what to do. <laughs> um, I find this is particularly interesting when you have a, older adults coming into a sport they want to know the hacks, right? How can I learn how to paddle in today? Tell me what I need mm -hmm. to do. Like the idea that you have to practice over several weeks to get good at it. They don't want to hear that. For years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah to even get a, like a basic. Um, so the, the um, so, uh, you know, trying to change, you know, how, what kind of feedback you give them, you know, just giving them suggestions rather than here's the, the do this exact thing. Um, is one of the ways I do it. Um, and, and just kind of getting them to try things, um, you know, and, and experience themselves with kind of the, the constraints. I find people, once they experience, oh, that worked, then they, they, kind, of, they kind of get a, a aha moment. <laughs> but it is something at first you have to kind of uh, sometimes change their attitude about, about, about it, the way from the, they've been typically coached for sure. Right. And you mentioned constraints again. Um, there's three types of constraints, correct? Mm -hmm. um, could you go over those? Sure. There, um, so the idea there's uh, individual constraints, which is what you you bring, your height, your weight, your flexibility, your strength. Um, there's the task constraints. You know what are the specifics of the this task I'm performing? You let her the, the rules. The um, oh, we got some. Oh, there, <laughs> um, the rules of the sport, you know, uh, how many players, how many, you know, what kind of implement am I using? And then environmental constraints like the wind, gravity, friction, rain. Um, so, okay. so those individual constraints, also fatigue and, and things um, as well. So, um, so there are these kind of all interact to kind of affect your performance. The, the biggest one the coach is going to influence is the task constraints. Mm -hmm. Um Right. So, you know, if I was doing paddling and I put the gates wider apart, 
uh, or closer together, that's changing a task constraint. That's going to change the demands of the task on the, on the person uh, or the yeah. things people are going around. Um, those are the biggest ones. Individual constraints, though, I think is a big opportunity um, when you see that's how we can, I think we can connect strength and conditioning to, to more skill. We kind of treat those as a separate. Um, but I think if we identify things where you think the athlete could be stronger uh, and, and help tie it to the gym, I think that that's a, a good way to do things. Can, can you expand on that a little bit? I'm, I'm not sure if I quite got that. And, and I know we have an SNC guy on from our, from our sports center in Halifax. So uh, do you mind just uh, elaborating on that a little bit if you can? Yeah. So we do like in, 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 you know, an athlete I'm working with, you know, you find, um, you know, they're not, they can't adopt this kind of movement pattern you want, no matter what cue you're giving them and uh, what kind of constraint you're adding on the, on the field. Sometimes it might be a, like an issue with flexibility or they don't have, uh, they're not as strong in their grip as something. So right. sometimes you can identify those and like, let's go back in the gym and work on that. And then that, that actually supports this, the skill right. development instead of just doing general exercises like bench yeah. presses or something. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And we're, we're working hard on controlling like wind and rain and things like that, but we haven't figured out how to, how to do that exactly. So. Yeah. The, the idea, I, I like to separate this idea, uh, the, the, like between a capacity and a skill, a capacity is like strength, flexibility, speed. And yeah. when, when we do, when we increase those in the right way, it gives you the opportunity to be more skillful. It doesn't guarantee it. Right. Yeah. If I can run faster, I can go through a gap that another player can't. It creates these other opportunities and solutions yeah. for me that another person won't have. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Courtney, are you gonna get to your crew boat questions or? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I just had a question about crew boats. So we have boats where you can have two or four people that come together. Um, and my question is basically that there's variability between people and variability within yourself. So like, how do you have four people come together with this idea of repetition without repetition and all this variability? And like, how would you coach a crew boat with this ecological approach or like a group of people within the same boat? Yeah, so the, the, idea, um, the idea there, you know, to develop kind of team, team uh, coordination and things on that is you want to uh, give so that, a concept we have in in, in the ecological approach is the idea of a affordance right so it's a it's an opportunity so I perceive opportunities for action in my environment I can go through this space I can go over that I can do this and the idea as a team you want to do as a team is to develop shared affordances so they they both they they both through interacting and doing kind of activities together, they're perceiving things at the same time. They they know each other's uh, capabilities, um, uh, you know what their strengths and weaknesses to experiencing. So, again, it's the same kind of uh, philosophy. The the we want to keep it them and working together as much as possible, rather than train them all individually. Um, give them kind of problems, different problems to solve in situations. And um, for example, in, in the team sports I work in, it would be changing the number of players, changing the spacing. So they learn to work together and solve, coordinate in these different, rather than telling them plays, like you need to do this now, you need to do that now. We want them to kind of learn to pick up things from the environment and make the decisions. I see this, I see that you're open the same time that you see you notice it and you run up into the opening and I pass. We don't have to have a set play. So it's we're, we're, we're picking up things from the environment because we're working together in practice and, and things like that. That makes sense. <laughs> but you also, so I guess, you know, when you're talking a crew, you're talking about a coordination in terms of rhythm and uh, other things. So it's learning to pick up the information I think a, a lot yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the big things is weight shift. Like they always bitch about, you know, are we leaning left? And then mm. uh, someone else saying, no, we're leaning right. We can't agree on what. And it's just like, mm. you know, regardless, you got to deal with it and move the boat. So, um, but the, there's so much time spent on bitching about the, the weight and where it's going and all that. And 
you know, just you have to accept, I mean, you could probably make it a little better, but how much better it's, I've never seen it improve so much in a short <laughs> time. I mean, it's just like, sometimes you just have to, like, like it's, I just feel like they're trying to be too perfect instead of like just accepting it. Let's figure out how to move the boat given this, that we have this left lean or whatever, like we would on a side wind or a headwind or whatever. Right. And, yeah. And that's something like in, in a, pre, in practice, you could deliberately add a constraint where you put a weight on one side of the boat more than the <laughs> other and create instability and get people used to adapting to that and, and adjusting to that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 So it's kind of, it's the same kind of principles, you know, problem solving, coordinating uh, on, on a team. But the idea is we're all kind of, you know, perceiving the weight the you know, adjusting rather than having some, you know, cognitive higher level instruction that we all need to do this now. Yeah. We're all picking up the same information acting together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Courtney, do you, have, do you have one more question before we get, we open up with some questions and, and Ryan can come on. And when we get to the questions, guys, we, we'd love for your, for you to come on camera and be able to ask Rob uh, yourself, right? Instead of us reading it and stuff. So it's a little more personable. Courtney, do you have, do you have one last thing with Rob before we- I think up? I'm good. We can get to the questions. Are you good? Okay. Yeah. So uh, Ryan, do you want to pick someone there? Um, like Mike Robinson might've been first and Mike's one of the coaches that was familiar with your, with your work. Uh, Mike works at a Calgary and long time coach. Yeah, let's go with, hi everyone. Let's go with Mike. Mike was asking about, uh, you know, the sequencing, do, uh, do you give external feedback or external cues and then let them experiment um, or experiment first and then try and give those external cues. So Mike, if I didn't <laughs> summarize that effectively. No, 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 I think, better. yeah, I think there's no, you know, there's no exact one way to do it. Um, I like to, well, for example, I'll give the tennis example. What I, so the, the way that we teach tennis normally is we teach you how to stroke, do a tennis stroke before we let you play, <laughs> right? You have to do over and over. Here's how do you do a forehand. What I like to do now is let's just get play, kids playing. So you create a simple game where they have to rally. And then when I see a kid, oh, they're, they're hitting the ball way behind them and really flat, then I come in with the external cue. Um, because sometimes you'll find you don't need it. Um, if you have the right scenario, some people will just kind of get the right pattern, initial coordination pattern on their own, and you don't really need to cue. So I, I would rather see kind of how they're moving, what they're doing first, and then come up, add the cues and the constraints to kind of uh, tweak things is the way I think about it. But yeah, that's a, the, but there's no, no right or wrong or right or wrong way for sure. Good. Uh, yeah, Rob, maybe I'll let Emma come on. Um, yeah, it's an extension of, of, of Rob's response there in terms of does it differ for younger athletes in that skills acquisition phase or mm -hmm. when there is a movement pattern within our sport that it maybe that's not intrinsically a feeling, right? It, or, or they haven't experienced that kind of movement pattern before. But Emma, do you want to come on and come on, Zoldi? I mean, you, you pretty much asked the question there, <laughs> but. Um... Yeah, I find that coaching younger athletes, it's it's really difficult. I know Rob got us to uh, start asking questions to the athletes about how did that feel and trying to get those responses from them. But a lot of the times they are limited to good or bad. <laughs> they have that difficulty finding that internal kind of feedback. Um, so I was just wondering what your thoughts were in terms of age. Um, so you're talking about getting the feel the for right position. So s sometimes what I, what I do is I kind of separate, you know, so we're not going to hit the ball now. Well, an example I have, I work sometimes with archery. Um, we're not going to shoot the, the arrow at the target in this one. But what I want you to do is I want to position, actually sometimes physically position them. I want you to get the feel of what this feels like of being in this position where we have this stability. So we're not worrying about the arrow and where it's going. We're not worrying about performance. We're just getting, and in those situations, I think sometimes internal 
is okay because you're really just talking about getting a feel for the body position and, and, and things like that. Um, and, and so sometimes I, I find like you do need to give people a big push um, or that like people won't bend their knees at all. <laughs> you have to really give them, okay, well, let's, let's try this. But then after you kind of let them move from there on, on their own, but you, for sure, if, if they're not kind of finding the general coordination pattern, I, I do that as well, if that helps. Thank you. Awesome, thank Mark, you. Uh, didn't you also go to Queens, Rob? I did, yes. Yeah. Emma, Emma went to, is going to Queens currently. Where are you going? Yeah. Yeah, no, could 19, I, like I won't say when. <laughs> 93, <laughs> I, Queens 93, I think it was, yeah. The talk of all the the feedback and things like that brought me back to the motor control and learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a part of this movement and revelation is just getting these ideas into more connected with coaching and, and getting them coaches. And what I what I find what I found is a lot of the coaches I work with are doing a lot of this stuff already. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just putting a fancy name on it and putting a theory to it. But a lot of coaches are doing these these things already really, really well. Um, you know, so it, it, it just trying to connect the two. This the idea that we're kind of not stuck where we are. We can, you know, we can speed up acquisition and and, and Kind of at the other end, Rob, you were talking about working with high-level athletes, kind of optimization. You know, they already got the basic coordination yeah. down. It's right. How can we get the most speed out of them we can get? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's good. Hey, okay, um, Rob, um, I'll, I'll try not to ask the whole question this time and bring the person on, but I, Katie had a great question in terms of um, external cues and, and, and performance. Mm -hmm. Katie, you want to come on and, and ask that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned the benefits to focusing on external factors, and I was just wondering if there's a danger to performance with too much external focus. So, for example, in our sport, focusing on um, the wind and the waves and acknowledging them can be helpful, but there's also almost a danger of falling into that thought pattern and getting overly focused. So. I was wondering if you know where that sort of boundary is or um, how to focus on making it useful and not go past it, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, that, that's, that's a good point. I think, yeah, in general, there's kind of, we, we, we can separate different types of external focus, right? Foci, like uh, there's like how far it is from your body. Are you focusing close to your body? What's happening right in front of your boat or with your paddle versus way down the course? Um, so I think in general, we want to have shift between a lots of them, right? You don't want to get fixated on just one thing. You're right. I think you would, um, if you were focusing too much way down the course and ways and wind, you'd probably, your stability control of the boat would be lost because it's not as effective. So I think you're right. We want to keep shifting. Um, and we see that kind of when we look at gaze behavior as well, but really skill athletes are moving their eyes around picking up lots of different information. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, you cueing someone to look, think about other external focus would be what I would do in that situation, but that's a very good point. Awesome. Well, Thank you very much. Okay, Rob, we had a, a yeah, question from Richard. Um, and I think it deals with how, how, how do you, prove technique or teach technique when there's a there is an obstacle you can't overcome and, and, and Richard's example is like chronic pain that 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 impedes movement yeah that that's it that's a good point and, and the way that we think about um, pain is is um, as a, is another constraint right it, it's limiting what movement patterns you can use and a lot of these ideas we're, we're starting to apply to physiotherapy as well right? Um, and then the idea is um, instead of using very simple rehab and physiotherapy exercises where we're trying to avoid pain, we're trying to move to getting people to explore more against it and learning how to deal, with, find a thing that works for them. Because pain, yeah, it can lead to very ineffective solutions. Um, so I, I, that is a tricky one. It is a very tricky one, but I think um, getting people to kind of getting more, the same kind of ideas, more variability, more exploration in the movement, um, working with the pain is, is what 
you know, people are starting to move towards. Good question. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Quinn has his hand raised. So Quinn, you want to come on and, and ask your question? Um, like how is, um, how is, um, so, so once, once people learn a different, like does people like, so, so if you, if you learn one sport and then you learn, does people learn really quickly? Like, how does that work? You so kind of the transfer between sports. Yeah. Yeah. What, what we find is there's, there's, it really depends on what kind of skills you're talking about. Um, there's some, you know, sports that involve hitting like tennis and baseball, where there's going to be some kind of transfer. Uh, mm -hmm. But in general, the, the bottom line is you, you need to practice specific, uh, you know, to become good at, at paddling, you got to practice paddling. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, uh, so there's not a whole lot of, there's a lot of other benefits, right? Uh, for psychological reasons and health reasons to being diverse, especially as a kid doing not focusing on one sport solely, but in general, the, it, there's not a ton of transfer from one sport to the other for the most part we see. Yeah, that's what I mean. It is, yeah. yeah. And we'll, so just thank, thanks, Gwen. That's a good question. That mm -hmm. leads to another one around, because uh, I think you talk about in your book about donor sports. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on what yeah, donor so sports this, are? This idea that there, there's some sports like that uh, may be beneficial to, for for your main sport um, because they're going to get you to, to use the one that all, the researchers in, that talk about that a lot is parkour. So that jumping from obstacles, like playing around, like getting used to using space and exploring may be beneficial for a lot of other sports that you, you have to kind of learn the same things. But you're not really going for like direct transfer there. You're going more kind of developing the capacities we, we were talking about. But yeah, in general, the kind of sad truth is you got to, it's very, transfer is very specific. We get good at this specific thing we practice really um it doesn't mean that it's not beneficial but but it really um you, you really need to work on your main sport yeah yeah okay good are there Rob, i had a question um i i think that's it for the chat so if there's anyone else that wants a question please put in the chat but when you talked about uh there's no info from the cone that makes perfect sense to me but what i, I was thinking when we teach technique is there beneficial benefits to teaching technique on in, in an irregular surface so if we use a, a paddling erg versus being on the water or should technique always be in the actual uh, movement pattern that we do yeah no no that's a great question ryan no like i think this idea you don't have to actually have everything there and, and like always be playing game essentially playing the sport itself i think we can pull it out and and do kind of art more artificial kind of things um as long as we have those key components there the the coupling uh the kind of the that the information that normally drives your movements there um then i, th I think there could be a lot of a lot of benefits to things like that uh for sure um, so no, no, I think as long as you kind of have a, a logic of why you're doing it, and as I said, keep the whole kind of skill together. Um, so just, you know, uh, you know, the, the big problem with, so the, what we do with cones, instead of cones, what I like to do is I have kids play tag. So while you're dribbling the ball, some other kids running to try to touch you. Um, and so you move to get away from them. Um, so to move or get away from them, I have to look at them right and see which way they're coming at me so it's not really like soccer and so some of the things we do don't really look like the real sport but they have kind of the key elements there that's the important point i think i you were talking about uh like a soccer rugby coach that had headbands on them so that they had to look up mm -hmm. having different colored jerseys they were scrimmaging in a, in a small space and they had different you know so red or black on each helmet or head so they had to look up to see and I, I wish I knew that when I was coaching my kids in hockey, but uh, it's too late now. So uh, I have one final question. I'm going to put you on the spot with something, but uh, okay. I think Ryan and Grace has something, a question there. 
I, I didn't see Grace. Um, I see Katie's question. I think if that's a follow up from Grace has her hand up. It's not in the oh, chat. Okay. Let's, let's go Grace and then we'll go to Katie. My apologies, Grace. Katie again. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, Rob. Thanks so much for uh, doing this with us. Um, okay. So my question is uh, based on multitasking. So when you're teaching complex movements, is there like a limitation to how many um, I guess, cues to use before it becomes overwhelming to an athlete? And what is that limitation? Yeah, absolutely. I can give you a little story. One of the, the things I work, sometimes I work with tennis and baseball players and they come in, they're really struggling. And what I do is the first thing I do is I tell them, I want you to hold the racket backwards. I want you to hold it by the head. I'm going to hit the ball to you. And then I just want you to flip it in the air and swing or hit. And when they do that, I, they immediately do better. <laughs> and the reason is they don't have time to think of all those cues. They're so in their head about all the cues and instructions they've been given when they're swinging that it's killing them. And then when you have, make them flip it in the air, they can't do that. So yeah, yeah, you, don't, you can't overwhelm them with, with cues. So I think it's you, you just want to focus on kind of one aspect of the movement at a time and, and then kind of build on it. Um, and then you know, if you're using kind of these analogy cues and then external cues, you, 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 sometimes you get like multiple parts at the same time, right? And what I mean is you, you, you get the whole, the whole movement more holistically rather than, okay, you need to bend your knees first, then your hips. And then sometimes if you, if you use kind of these analogies and instruction, you can get more of a, the whole kind of process you want at the same time. So that's a, one, another way to try to challenge that. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Great question, Grace. Um, a quick, the quick follow up from Katie, and then we'll finish off with uh, Rob. Yeah. I'll try and be quick. Um, I was just wondering, in uh, well, as well with the external focus, the beneficial level of external focus, um, in terms of being aware of competitors within a race, um, to some level, it could be strategically beneficial by like moving. Um, knowing when to move on somebody or how much pressure to put um, in a race. Is there a certain optimal level of focus um, on external factors or other people's performance before it can lead to being overwhelming or um, leading to choking? I know from personal experience, it's helpful up to a certain point, and then um, you can kind of fall into a pit of being overwhelmingly focused on other people. Um, so yeah. Yeah, Any for answer? for sure. Kat. I think, you know, in the, in the research we talk about, the distinction between knowledge of performance and knowledge of results. So the knowledge of results is like your outcome where you're, you're in the race. Knowledge of performance is how well you're executing your movement. And I think you need a good balance of those. I think you're right. If you get way too formative of where your opponents are, you obviously need that. You're right for strategy or, or what, where the ball went when, you know, like in, in base, baseball, for example, you can hit the ball super hard and some right at someone, right. And, and then you get, you're out. So you need to kind of, I think, get people to focus on the performance, you know, uh, what's a feel, how well, you know, uh, the, picking up the information from the water or whatever it is um, to evaluate how well they're doing. You're, you're right. But that, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, getting kind of too focused on where you stand um, and not what you are doing yourself is, can be detrimental. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right. So let's, uh, are we all, everyone's questioned out. We can, we can finish off with one final question for Rob. So this is uh, coupled or uncoupled. And I'll give it just a brief background. It was it was hot yesterday in Toronto. Not Arizona summer hot, but it was hot. <laughs> and we had kids trying to tip your boats, and then our, our older high performance athletes were done the workout, and they're just playing uh, and doing some balance drills, right? And uh, so they, they they throw the paddle or they ha they hand paddle and stuff, and that's often a common game we play with with kids when they're learning balance. So with, with with a drill like that, like taking taking the paddle like out where they're tippy. Right, so they can't. They don't have the implement in their hand. They can't take a stroke. They can't connect to their to their foot rest. Would that be considered like? Would it be helpful at all? And, and and would that be like coupled or uncoupled, as far as helping them to to move faster in, in the boat, which is ultimately the goal? No, I I think that's uh, coupled. To me, that's definitely useful. You're like when you're you, so that, that if I understand you correct, they're just sitting yeah. in the boat with no, yeah. and you have to shift your body 
yeah, position yeah. to stay. Yeah, that so to in order to do that task, you have to pick uh, information from your your vestibular, your your right. um, your proprioceptive senses, and um, so the inf your, that's the same information you use in a race to you know stay balanced. Uh, obviously, the way that you're adjusting, so you've changed the kind of the output level, but the the, the way you move to do that. But um, no, that that sounds like a great way to, to do that so yeah sometimes you take away the kind of response the person can do yeah. um but but it's not kind of yeah i think i think that's a great a great okay. task yeah good 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 yeah thank you that's i've debated that long in my head so, uh, <laughs> it sounds fun too yeah yeah uh, <laughs> yeah on, on a warm day yeah <laughs> try okay. to tip well, people to the line. i think I think we're just gonna gonna wrap up here and, and maybe rob you can i know you have your book behind you there maybe i don't I don't have, I have yours somewhere, but it's not right here. I don't know if you want to get it and show people. Yeah, just, but yeah my, my shameless self-emotion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's How We Learn to Move. Um, uh, it's on Amazon and, and everything, if people are looking. Yeah, the, I, I wrote it because I, I got a lot of people interested in these ideas and yeah. asking where to start. There's a lot of great books that go way deeper and, uh, you know, how to design constraints. And you mentioned Nick Minkleman's work. Book, yeah, the language book. of coaching that's yeah. a great book yeah um but i just kind of want to give people a starting point well it's an excellent book and and uh and, and your podcast is uh, perception and action um is there any place else to reach on on twitter or uh yeah they're probably the easy mm -hmm. if you go to perceptionaction.com it's kind of got yeah. all my stuff there oh, and i have some there. resources for for people lots of videos and okay. um, some discussions and things yeah okay we'll get Haley to, to send that out to to, to everybody uh, Courtney, do you want to come on and say any last remarks or questions or thanks to Rob? Where'd you no, go? I'm just, uh, I'm right here. Okay. My <laughs> calls, let's go. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just a big thank you for coming on and sharing this new perspective, um, giving everybody a starting point. Thank you. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we really appreciate it. We, we, we started kind of doing some of these, uh, CKO, it's Canoe Kayak Ontario, uh, during, uh, during COVID, um, you know, and, and we managed to get some some big hitters on. And Courtney's doing this project with with me as part of her apprenticeship uh, uh, coaching as she kind of transitions from being an athlete because she's thirty now. So she's <laughs> thinking about thinking about next steps. And despite my efforts to dissuade her from coaching, she's she's interested in it. And uh, but again, we we managed to come up with a with another uh, big hitter in the field. So. Uh, uh, you know the Canadian connection came through, so we really appreciate your, really appreciate your your time. My and pleasure, sharing. my pleasure. It's awesome. I really enjoyed it. Next time you come up, we'll get you out in a boat. And, uh, yeah, I'll get yeah, you yeah. It's been a bit in a while, but and you're, you're uh, gonna fall in with the paddle. I hate no. to tell you. I, I went kayaking here uh, <laughs> uh, last yeah, year, so I, I didn't yeah. fall. I didn't fall in then. So but well, we'll put you in something. It was pretty calm, so yeah. Yeah. yeah bring so. your bathing suit. <laughs> thanks, guys. Okay. All right. Hey. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Just stay on, Courtney. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right, that was great, guys.